So we've, we've done the meeting right now. It's time for you to do your work. And so we're going to take the idea shared both of this morning. Uh, and, and then like you hear next, we're going to then shift to some doings, the planning, some building. So, so let me say the first, this session is all about how we represent what is happening in our spirit. Uh, getting past the uh, laborers, what is happening in the schools? You will hear a barrage of negative statements of how poor these schools are doing, how bad teachers are teaching, how schools are structured without having set foot with a school or talk to an educator in quite some time. We have a premise detection problem. And others have captured this idea to send out a narrative to use it for political purposes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I want to share two things. The first is that uh, things are changing and some are actually for the positive. We're going to be more shocked to hear that. But some things are going well. I want to make an announcement. Um, our, our dean in our school for education and partnered across the campus at Stanford to launch a new program from our Stanford Learning Accelerator. Here's the idea. If students across the state are going to be involved in ethnic studies, and we want to ensure that they have world-class ethnic studies education. So what might that look like? So instead of asking professors to design the curriculum, we're partnering with those who do this work already to co-design, to implement, and make available. And so you'll be hearing announcements from the Rob program about this initiative. We invite you to spread the word and get involved. This will be led by Dr. Antero Garcia, the brand new ethnic studies initiative being launched in on the brand. So with that, uh, you, you are lucky. You're lucky to be in the building. I am lucky to be in the building because we have a world class set of scholars to share some ideas today. So we're going to now talk about media, language, race, and education. Um, and our experts today. I, 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 I mean, I can say this, we're all renowned scholars who just happen to show up for brunch. Right? And I just, I can't believe that you, you showed up in brunch. Uh, Dr. Adam Banks from Stanford University explores rhetorical structures and their connection to race and community. Uh, joined by Dr. Janelle Scott from UC Berkeley, who is a renowned scholar on race, politics, and educational structures. And so we'll be in, in conversation today about how media is used to send messages about education, and then ways we need to think about that differently. And to foster an excellent conversation today, I want to introduce our moderator, Tammy Vicentano from San Jose State University. A round of applause for the I'm good. Okay. Sorry, that was oh. my bad. <laughs> well, I think in that situated, you know, Brian already mentioned everybody who was uh, working so hard on this, but I just got to say, I have never been to an academic conference with chicken and wobbles, education grids, different grids. Ridiculous playlists, you know, medicines, and you might ask folks to come out and do intellectual work on a Saturday morning, like all of you are. That's how you do it. All right. Um, I am Mike Dapna as the moderator. Um, it's a real honor to be here to talk to you um, that has got a back of base. Um, so we're going to take a deep dive into the heart of the matter. How are media representations shaping the narrative in the modern world for wars with and education? Um, I think media in the broader sense of television and narratives, social media. <laughs> let, let me offer a doubt, maybe I'm going to answer before I pass to my colleague, right? So, uh, in in the case of, of those who mean us harm, right? In the case of those who are constantly launching these attacks, what we're dealing with are technological and media ecosystems that are stacked with each other and, and multiply, maybe even exponentially, uh, create greater effect, right? So um, the, the digital landscape is what it is right now, but we want to make sure, first of all, these attacks are not new. And we'll get into more detail about that. But before misinformation and disinformation in the social media landscape, we, we know about the cable uh, television landscape 
the talk radio landscape preceded that, right? And so when all of this vitriol was happening in, in talk radio and the cable uh, news scene emerged, those multiplied each other. It's not like when one new technology emerges, it displaces the others, it connects with them and multiplies them, right? And so when the social media landscape came about, uh, with the ability for all kinds of people to launch all kinds of vile into the discourse that multiplies what was already happening on cable television. And so these, these media ecosystems work together and we got to make sure we attend to that as we think about how these attacks happen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure Adam's gratitude to Brian and Kendra and everyone who made today possible for um, I think I don't know if our Adam's family went on an answer and um, just try and, and focus our attention on what's happening uh, in our society with, in, in the US, but also around the world as a, a global restrictive movement um, in which education is at the center. And what I think is at stake in this moment is the future of the public. Yeah. Um, and, and, and education that be the focus where if you are a school age child in the United States, 80% of you attend the public school, right? So public education and, and then by extension, the public library, right? These are the two both the full side of the attacks. And what's under attack, right, is our, our multiracial democracy's future. And who is going to have a place and a voice in that future? And what will public education and the public library and freedom to learn will play in there? I think it's important to recognize that uh, starting in 2017, the school age population is now over 50% minoritized children. In California, that number has uh, far exceeded that for some time. And so we, when we think about the focus on public education, we're talking largely about the, the future and our ability to realize racially just and adequate schools across the board. So, because even though our schools are diverse, we know they're wildly segregated yeah. and unequal. And just as we began to have these global conversations in 2020, because of the murder of George Floyd and went by Frank, yeah through media and these global conversations started happening about racial injustice. You know, by one estimate, there were Black Lives Matter actions in over 80 countries around the world are focused on anti-blackness and um, and the role of the state and um and, and social structures in in facilitating anti-blackness just four months after George Floyd is murdered, Christopher Rupo starts his campaign against critical race theory, um, drawing from the conservative backlash, backlash story of the 1619 project for So I just want to put the, the media, the use of media in context with the attack on the public um, and what role public education and public libraries play in our, our the future of our networks. Oh, just to add very quickly, so, some of these um, attacks get a lot of eat a lot of conversation. We, we hear about them a lot, but I want to make sure that we don't miss the more everyday uh, attacks that might seem to be banal as well. And so, you know, when, when Janelle mentioned um, the attacks on anything public, any kind of public good, that has been happening over time. We can take this all the way back to the beginning of vouchers, which is really part of the legacy of resistance to Brown v. Board, right? Uh, and so along with the attack on anything public being part of this systemic work, there's also even, uh, there have been sustained attacks on even the idea of a common good, right? Uh, a common wealth. And so we, we want to make sure that we're connecting the different kinds of attacks that build and sustain each other so that when you hear attacks on something like woke or, first of all, I love what Black folks do, but that years ago on social media, stable was the actual hashtag, right? Uh, and there was a playful conversation about it, but I'll sleep though. And so, um, but, so we, we, we want to make sure that we connect the attacks that would seem to be more banal with the ones that get more uh, sensational conversation. Yeah, and I think just to underscore that, and, you know, it, it is just when it be that separate, right? So thinking about the history, and I was just re listening to this interview with Wiley, who was one of the main um, 
it's uh, whistleblowers for Cambridge Analytica and how carefully, like during the Trump campaign, that was orchestrated to bring people together. And so um, Steve Bannon's idea was that politics flows through culture, right? And we see that now. So if you want to make a big impact, make an injury impact on culture, and that's going to shape what's happening. And I feel like, and so, yeah, bringing it back to Rizzo here is writing with this. CRT, and it, you know, a lot of it was the words, critical race and theory put together. It wasn't about in theory. Um, and then he gets on Tucker Carlson, and it goes, you know, so anyway, I think I appreciate that. It's true. There's also, I, mean, I think we can't remove the infrastructure supporting what takes off and what does it. And so, yeah, you know, Rupo and the Manhattan Institute, they have a $22 million endowment in two portions. So, um, but, I mean, there's real money in organizational structures and all, also not just one sort of alone um, crying in the darkness. So, I see your team, there's a reason. Yeah, it's what was a key player. And anyway, so I'm going to move on to the second question because they were supposed to get to these videos. Um, Maybe we already kind of talked about this, but we often hear about well, cancel culture and critical race during the days. How do you see these issues being amplified and start with the media outlets and what do practices have on education? Good thing. Well, some some media, some scholar, I don't know, but I, I think the most important thing to, to underscore here is, is that so no one gets certain kinds of attention, critical race theory gets certain kinds of attention. And let me let me sidebar here. The critical part is what I want to highlight in why that phrase, because as Brian said earlier, folks ain't reading Kimberly Crenshaw or Richard Delgado or Derek Bell, right? Uh, it's it's a totem, right? That it, it's it used to make a whole set of attacks. But but the critical part of that is, let me be clear where you're critical, right? Because it's the how dare these colored folk have the nerve to critique these systems? Y'all are supposed to be grateful that you even in here, right? And so I mean, we want to make sure we understand, I'm a writer of Christian rights, we want to understand the rhetorical work that's, that's happening here. But but now that I've made my digression to come back uh, to the point, uh, the main point, every era has a version of this, right? You can trace it decade by decade for the phrase that became that totem that allowed people to make a whole bunch of attacks up underneath it that are basically still white supremacist attacks on the humanity of folk of color. And people in a lot of other you know, uh, ways of identifying as well. And, and so in, in the 90s, what was it? You all know, PC, political correctness. In, in, in Black freedom movements, you know, uh, the the gall to to uh, instantly and thoroughly attack people as communists, regardless of their actual political or ethical commitments, right? And so every era has a version of this. And so we have to, it's, I'm not saying, okay, we've got to connect all of these, but we just have to understand that this is not a new tactic. And so as soon as this discursive moment passes, there will be another version of it that's what we need to be prepared for. Yeah, I think I think that's really helpful. And I I think I would argue we're already past it. I think yeah. we're, we've already moved. It's not saturated. Well, I think it's saturated. And as Ripo said, um, I mean, he's been very public about this. It's not like this is in a you know dark world that everybody can He's made these covered statements when he said, we're just freezing the brand. And so that eventually anything that relates to diversity or equity and inclusion will be worthy of critique and attack. And, you know, this just last month um, in Oakland, where I live, the local public school uh, was hosting uh, affinity nights for parents. So, you know, African-American um, parents of African-American children and you know, Spanish american children, these, these nights are open to all, but we're designed as the main groups are, people to build together, be in community with one another. Some disgruntled parent got to Fox News. Dark. Um, it apparently went viral on that those ecosystems, those media ecosystems, and the school uh, had a phone break called it. They had to close school for two days because they didn't know if this moment 
was actually going to manifest this time in violence, right? Um, and so I think we've moved to even being able to acknowledge that there is multiraciality in our community. It's not about CRT anymore. It's about, I don't like what you are doing, and therefore I will threaten to harm with you right. or take away what you have. And I think that's what a lot of schools are grappling with, such that they are voluntarily pulling things from shelves. Yeah. They are voluntarily canceling events. They're voluntarily, teachers are adjusting uh, what they introduce into their classroom because children and young adults are being encouraged to report teachers. Right. And so I think it's created a deep climate of fear uh, that that one day one of us might show up, right, as the new target on the oh, I just want to underscore something that's really important about what you said, right, in the, the folks being encouraged to report. And this connects to the media last week that we're in because it's where uh, a deeply intense surveillance culture, not simply surveillance by the state, that's not what I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, some scholars have talked about this as surveillance, the ways that everyday people participate in it, the way that surveillance culture meets the ease that our digital tools uh, create for it, right? We, we live in screenshot culture, right? We, we live in spaces where the ability of someone to take video instantly and use it to uh, be part of those attacks uh, is simply a part of everyday life that will continue and will intensify. So what that means for me is that that's part of the rhetorical situation, right? If, if that's if that's going to be a part of your everyday life in the classroom, in your scholarship, uh, in other kinds of work that you do, what steps do people take to prepare for that? How does that affect the strategies of those who want to continue the work for a more inclusive society that, that reflects the diversity that's all always and already been there? And <laughs> I think we have to think really specifically about who this is harming right now. Yeah. Right. So if you think about the laws in Florida, right. If you are a black teacher and want to talk about something that matters to you in your life that relates to your black and it's against the law, right? right? You can actually be fired for it. And so right, there's a there's a surgical targeting teachers of color, yeah. right? The rights of students of color to learn. And so I worry as we get back pull back to our field, to you know, to you know, educational researchers and, and those who work in the community with the teachers and school districts that our available tools are not up to them. Right. We talk about pipelines and right. increasing the numbers of teachers of color, and teachers of color are living in fear right. in many states. And it's not a kind of, you know, fantasy. There are real material consequences for teachers. As teachers are leaving the profession in droves at a very time, like I said, when the racial diversity of our population is at um, its most multiracial and, and socioeconomic socioeconomically diverse. So I think we have to think about also who's made vulnerable by the way these laws and regulatory frameworks are being written. That, right? But, but what, what needs to be said, and you all already know this, so you don't need us to tell you this, but through disingenuous arguments about supposedly all of this stuff is CRT or all of this stuff is full, the point is these are attacks on the humanity of people of color. It's not on the intellectual content, yet yeah, that's, that's what is being said, right? But these are attacks on the very humanity of Latin, Latinx, Latina folks, indigenous folks, black people, you know, and so many others are queer family. And, and so we, whatever our strategies are for response, we just have to be very clear that that's what the attacks are. Yeah, I think it's just not by chance, right, that it's a time when the student black demographic is shifting, right, and this is happening, obviously, the white victimization that's coming from it. I think we should move to our movie clips, our video clips. We talk about race in the school. The parenthetical race theory got a lot of attention recently. Some Missouri lawmakers that have been taking steps to the bans. New tonight, our Andy Laredo looked at how it could impact your child's education. What is critical race theory? Parents at this forum on race and curriculum in the Rockwood School District are not the only ones fired up about it. It's not the word racist. 
scholars of critical race theory define it as recognizing race as a social construct, but one that's been deeply embedded in American institutions throughout history. Like, say, so you can see implications of that today. You know, like in the criminal justice system or even democratic communities. Advocates say CRT urges people to grapple with systemic racism, to work toward understanding and fairness. What are the biases that could exist in the system so that we can actually create that platform and create that equity that we all want? But opponents have said CRT perpetuates racism. It's basically why you say and that is basically a racist viewpoint. Saying it pushes the idea that white people are inherently racist and people of color inherently oppressed. We can do a lot of good for the project, but if we're continually combined, uh, right. Uh, sorry. Speak to that. Okay. Yeah, there is some. Um, I mean, I think we've kind of discussed this other base, but how was media used to fix this, this frenzy of things that you see among the far right? What carrots or rangers are um, So I'm not very interested in talking about the, the so called far right. Um, I will offer a couple of uh, uh, points to your question, though. What's striking to me in this moment with those that we would consider uh, on, on the, the right side of the spectrum of, of U.S. political discourse, it's not, it's not the so-called extremes. It's the way that the extreme has become normalized. It's the way that core people in that particular party or those who align with them who would want to present themselves as more moderate have nothing to say to uh, their, their, their people, uh, right? So um, I, was, I was on the panel yesterday with the uh, MLK Institute uh, directed by the brilliant LeBron Martin. And we were looking at the Birmingham campaign, we were looking at the March on Washington at, at other uh, moments. And the, the quote from King that is often circulated, you know, he says his, his deepest disappointment is with the silence of those, you know, who refuse to, to speak back to what they know is happening, what we know is happening. And so um, when, when you get some of what we would consider to be the, the wildest statements uh, that, it, that is just deeply uh, attacking the humanity of, of the folk of color, you hear almost no one on that side of the political spectrum willing to speak back to me. So the pervasiveness of that silence, it allows this discourse to grow. So I, I, I want to talk about that piece of it. And of course, as we get into later in the conversation, let, let me just explain this uh, from my perspective. I'm a rhetorician. I study rhetoric because I'm interested in the agency of Black people. I'm interested in the agency of folk of color, right? I, I describe myself as a midnight believer, partially in response to King's sermon and knock at midnight, where, you know, uh, it, it was, to study rhetoric, Bob Lynch used to say, it demands a core optimism because you have to have some faith in the ability of humanity to get this stuff right because that's what enables, that's what enables people to continue to try to fight it out, to figure it out, excuse me, rather than fight it out. And, and so for all of these attacks on Black people in particular, you're, you're exacerbating racism, you're exacerbating divisiveness through this daring to be critical. None of these folks want to acknowledge how long Black people in particular, but folks of color across the board, have kept faith with this society, this possibility, despite almost all available evidence. And so no matter how deep the, the hatred, no matter how pervasive the racist exclusions, folks in these movements are continuing, continuing to try to appeal to the nation. They're, they're, they're trying to, to work this out in dialogue. 
And I think that needs to be noted, right? So, um, yeah, let me, let me hush that. <laughs> I think, you know, to connect this back to what is this all about, right? right? So we, yeah. we see these parents, and even as I deeply disagree, like are the parents are sending, as a, as a human being, what I perceive is fear, yeah. right? Um, anger, right? Worry. And certainly there's race, right? Like that, that's obvious right. to people who study issues of race and racial justice. But but I able to connect what's going on there. They really think something horrible is happening. Yeah. Right. Um, so where did they get that notion? We know schools are wildly unequal. We know that the children who are doing the worst by the metrics that we have are not the children of those women. Right. So, so empirically, we know that the grievances are not located in that very yeah. undergross room, despite showing real black women as we always do. Make them context, but I just want to offer that you know, since 2020, 20 states have introduced voucher programs. Yeah. Right. And the idea is to tap into that and yeah. say, as a parent, it is your right to choose the education. That maps on to what you and your family care about. So we're 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 stoking fear and worry, right? And again, we can critique where those fears and worries are coming from. But I think the fear and worry is real. And we're saying, here's the operant. Here's the operant from public education. And in fact, the state is subsidizing for right, you. That's right. You will subsidize your entry into wildly segregated and unequal private schools. And we will further destabilize public education. And that's happening in Texas right now and in Arizona, where public education's future is really at jeopardy here. And, and I, I don't want to be alarmist, but I think in these states where voucher programs have grown so large that they are actually destabilizing um, districts' ability to run schools, uh, we are really in, in within you know reaching distance of losing public education. And I am very critical of all the problems in public education. I don't defend what's wrong, but I think once we lose it, I think it's going to be a way to get it back. Mm. Right. And I, I do think that's what it's what is at stake. And those people have been made to be afraid. They really believe that there's something to be. Yeah. So you may be wondering, what's the deal with the GOP freak out over critical race theory? And it everywhere. It was even used that the GOP called its parents at a conservative conference last week. The old Marxism used economics to gain control. The new Marxism, the new Marxism uses identity politics. And the result is something that looks nothing like America. There's no reason to believe that this new Marxism will result in anything but what the old Marxism resulted in critical race theory is racism here in Sydney. and it should be rejected by every american of every race and let me tell you right now critical race theory is thinking it it is a lot and it is every bit as racist as the clans made in white sheets okay but here's the thing none of this is random this is the result of a highly manufactured strategy created by seasoned political operatives looking for the perfect wedge issue to take back power. Something to combat the energy of the only racial coalition that ended up in Georgia, and something to replace Blue Black Matter since January 6th and stole the fact slogan as they stand them. Conservatives in Congress took them and started chattering, which was then ingested into the fear system of Fox News. The tagline disseminated and the war against critical race theory evolved. No one wants a boogeyman near their kids, and certainly not in their classroom. The operatives know this. Those fears have got clear, and now, along with the fear of trans kids getting over junior high and ball, um, so Dr. Scott, I can touch a lot, a lot of these things, but um, I'm wondering. You know, she she describes as very systematic and organized, and we highlighted that for um, the campaign to, and especially how it's impacting not just education policy and what's happening, but for aid, right? These are going to be huge issues as the campaign comes to light. Yeah. Um, what do you think are some insights as we move forward? So, I think. Uh, 
there's a, a legal scholar uh, named Elise Bonnie, who I think is brilliant. And um, Bonnie has written uh, this article where she talks about uh, adaptive discrimination. And it's, it's very aligned with critical race theory, but it's really a focus on, on the law. And, and Bonnie essentially argues that whenever law manages to successfully stamp out its ability to discriminate, uh, new laws will be adopted and adapt, right? So that there's there's this adaptive effort, right? And I think, again, if we come back to 2020, which I know feels like ancient history at this point, just think of all the people in your life who never seemed to care about racial injustice, right? Yep. They were starting to really care about it. Yep. And they were starting to put some things together and ask me questions maybe that they hadn't asked before. Um, and I think what, what Joy Reid invokes here about Georgia, right, seeing that coalition come together to elect Democratic representatives in a state that where it has been very difficult, right, for the, the elected representatives to reflect actually lives in Georgia, um, that's scary for people who fear losing power. And so I think that some of what is going on is we're seeing this adaptive discrimination happening in real time. What I want to say, on one of the reasons I think I'm aligned with Adam, one of the reasons I study the politics of education is also out of a sense of critical optimism. Mm -hmm. um, and that I do believe that people coming together collaboratively can realize the kind of public education we need and want for our time. And so, as Brian um, invoked in the beginning in his opening comments, you know, public education and public educators are under sustained and, and brutal critique. But what we see from all the fully is that if you actually interview parents within public schools, they rank their schools very high. They're very happy with what schools are doing. So there's this sort of public discourse and noise, but people who are closest to school in communities are fighting for them. Um, and fighting for their survival. Uh, and I think if we look optimistically where communities come together using social media, but also working with teacher genuine and civil rights organizations and youth programs have actually successfully fought the fans. So we get Indiana um, saw an unsuccessful attempt to pass CRT legislation, Europe, Pennsylvania, you saw the community come together and say, not here, we're not doing this here. That's not who we are. And so as I look at across what feels really heavy, I'm very um, optimistic about the power of local communities coming together and then coming together across different local communities and working together. And I think the youth justice space is really important to keep an eye out for. There are some really powerful young people organizing. Um, there's the Youth Justice Coalition in Georgia, for example. They're incredible. Uh, they're working with uh, kids in other states. They, they're working largely on budgets in Georgia and we're able to um, when the legislature tried to actually pass the bill to defund public education, they were able to get that defeated, um, largely because they figured out that the legislature's not going to end those bills at like midnight on Thursday, and they were all up on TikTok, <laughs> and they organized an action the next day. And so I think really when you're looking to and that's when with your organizers, uh, teachers, uh, their, and their unions, um, which I think are really the focus of a lot of this is the teachers' unions. And again, we can be critical, but we can also talk about why we need a teacher a, a union in the first place, especially around free speech attacks. Um, these are spaces where I think there's possibility uh, and hope. Uh, I'll, I'll add just a couple of things here because I think that was laid out uh, beautifully and powerfully. So back to the, the session yesterday, um, as we had talked around several different topics, uh, our, our leader, Professor Martin, said, look, you can't you can't leave me on this road. No, but where is the hope, right? And so I think, I think Professor Scott laid that out compellingly. Um, another layer of this, of where there might be room for some, some cautious critical optimism, uh, is in the increasing desperation in these tactics. Right, the, 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 the folks who are making enemies out of people who've never been their enemy are resorting to more and more anti-democratic strategies to, to pursue these agendas, to, to more and more open, explicit, bitterness and vile, again, to folks who have never been their enemies. And, and so uh, that, that desperation is going to show. 
Uh, you know, gerrymandering, the ridiculousness of it, despite whatever the Supreme Court might have said in a ruling, uh, there's there, there's some possibility that we can expose that desperation, that, that we can expose, but at least the question, why do your politics and public discourse depend on so much open hatred? Depend so much, uh, you know, why do you need a better politics? You know, to to, to uh, advance anything you say you believe in. So, so there, there's some possible room uh, for optimism there. And, and you, you talked about some of the organizing that was happening out of view. Uh, one thing I want to add that, that maybe we'll get into more later. So, Florida and Texas and you know Tennessee and Virginia have joined in all of this explicitly with the laws and bans. Um, as much as people might. Attack, be able to legally attack public education and, and uh, create these strong figure fallacies around what they think teachers are doing or what's happening in these books that they're trying to ban. They can never stop you from doing what you want to do as a private citizen. Right? Uh, we all work way too hard in our jobs, you know, day to day. -day. I know that. But they, they can't stop how we connect the community. They can't stop ways that we can teach outside of the edifices, right? So a quick example, a solid the Association for the Study of African American Life and History made it a point to take its conference to Florida instead of boycotting so that they could put feet on the ground and build in these spaces with the people who are being affected by all of these bands, right? Uh, because you can't stop people from doing what they want to do in their private lives. So we, we still have the all kinds of room, metaphorically and physically, for the work that we see as important, no matter how much people might try to attack it in the public arena. Yeah, so I, I want to just highlight the, I think, the desperation. I think that's a really interesting connection to what I took from Dr. Vinaro's conversation about the claiming of white victimhood mm -hmm. and having to claim white as a racial identity is really moving into this space of like having to claim that it's that, right? And so how do we how do we tap into that opening up and understand I'm just being mindful of the time here. Um I want to stay in this book on possibility space a little bit and then and then that way. As someone who works in the kind of justice space and see what young people are doing, there's amazing organizations in Oakland, a very awesome new climate justice organization. Young people are suing the state of Montana for right fossil fuels. Um, Dr. Banks, I wonder if you see, or, or Dr. Scott, either obviously can be tricky. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if you see that on, on social media, how, how young people, right, they are much more versed in it than, well, I'm not going to play some others that for a while. Um, how are they using this space to push back? Yeah, uh, I appreciate the question. You know, this lets me uh, ramble on something I care a lot about. Uh, so on, on one level, as unfortunate as it is, that so many people in the country seem to finally care about Black Lives Mattering after the, the horrific murder of, of George Floyd. And actually, let me go off on the block a little bit to set this point up. We, one thing we need to attend to is just how much brutality it takes to spark the conscience of so many in this nation. In other areas of the Black Freedom Movement, it took the brutality of what happened in Selma. It took the brutality of fire hoses and dogs being sick on children in Birmingham. The children's campaign part of the Birmingham campaign is an important part of that history. And even though there had been movements and activism, we could really take it back to China 6. If as far as this current era of, of activism goes, um, that it took the accumulated reports 
of these killings and these murders to finally break that conscience a little bit with this one very particular one, right? Now, so I'll put you on the plot. Let me try to get to the point uh, or get, get back to somewhere we can move from. And yet, it didn't just happen that George Floyd's murder was the thing that, that, that brings that consciousness, the conscience and consciousness, because this activism, this demonstrating, this making the case had been happening for years in the streets and in the tweets that enabled some greater understanding uh, of, of just how much this was happening to emerge. So, if we had been relying only on mainstream news reporting of these murders, the nation would never have had the awareness of what was happening in Ferguson that emerged. This was individual people and collectives of people organizing on social media and in the streets, but specifically social media, to actively change the narrative of what reporting there was. This is what made Black Twitter so powerful. And you know, I would probably argue in a non-academic space that is a part of why so much is being done in this current era under his current ownership uh, to dilute that power. And so I talk about Black Twitter, and I'm still gonna call it Twitter Mama Name, Twitter, I'm gonna call it Twitter, right? Uh, no matter what particular style you would flash type villain uh, might want to do. Uh, forget my editorial last but, but the point here is, no matter the scales of economics that you pointed to and political power that, that we encounter in these attacks, the ability of people to organize in collectives and individually through these media uh, to actively resist these narratives, to actively counter these attacks, to actively plan how they want to put their bodies in the streets as well as their ideas in the discourse. No matter how bad economic uh, inequality is, there will always be those ways people can take back the mic to, to use the mic. We talk about the Stanford a lot. The thing I would add about that 2020 moment, right, is that it, it, it was joined by a time when many school districts were still remote. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so people were who could work at home were at home. And for the first time in my lifetime, we were having somewhat of a national conversation about educational equality. Yeah. Uh, because the remote schooling dynamic laid bare that you did as well as what you had at home. And if your family didn't have high speed internet access or a device, you yeah. couldn't access school, right? In the same way. If you had adults, caregivers who had to work outside the home, who worked multiple jobs, and there wasn't an adult to help you with technological glitches, right? We were starting to have that conversation like, oh, we have like a Canadian or the grading. It's a very fair. Right. If there is this deep home advantage, maybe the way we think about merit needs to disrupt. Like, mm -hmm. So I think what was at stake there, joined with the activism that you talk about, that has a much longer art, was that people were making the connection, right, between, I mean, we started talking about structural inequality, like as a national conversation, I've never seen that before in my life. And as this already acknowledged to me this morning, we're old, right? So, <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, I think what has happened as the sort of anti so called anti CRT, anti diversity, equity, inclusion work has taken on, it's really stopped out of those conversations in any kind of large scale way. And where I hope the continued activism of young people and people in the community will do is to insist that we continue to have fun conversations. Right, that we fundamentally are not allowing young people to have an even brighter deal. Uh, COVID did not fix it, it didn't uh, create it, um, but reopening schools also need to fix it. Yep. And I do worry uh, that educational researchers, the only, the, the, the predominant way that we have to talk about it is through the lens of the writing loss, right? Yeah. And we're, we, we are connecting 
whatever that is, right, to these broader issues of, of inequity, funding disparity, segregation. Yeah. None of those things have gone away. And so my hope in this activism is that we will continue to insist, right, that as we talk about political representation, as we talk about justice across environmental issues, I would I'd be remiss if I didn't add that we have this around the shooting, right? Um, which is very active and is really holding policymakers to it without trying to um, that, that these are really important spaces that can continue that conversation about education and its role, again, in this multiracial democracy. Actually, let me give one very quick comment in just underscore, you know, the good professor's laid down. Everything you said about that need for us to continue this work in community reminds me of why Robin Kelly has always insisted that study is as crucial a part of liberation work, of freedom work, as protest. We are educators, right? We can create spaces for people to continue the conversation together outside of the gaze, outside of the surveillance, outside of the school, and, and we can create conditions where we continue to study together and actually really think through these large, messy questions Again, often out of public view, we have that ability, and, and that's that's where we can be led by young people and how they organize to do a lot of that for themselves. So I think we're at time, and I just want to ask one last question of the panel before we open it up. Um, in building up both of those kind of pathways, what does it mean? That, so we have a pretty diverse audience in terms of right, and so thinking about educational researchers or um, policymakers, but also the, the educators in the room, the teachers in the K-12 schools. What does that mean for you right now? Like, how do we how do we carry this forward in those, you know, this hope and possibility? So, I mean, I think there's always been a need for researchers to be in community with teachers and um, school system leaders and, and practitioners and communities more broadly. I think, again, there's always been that need, that need is even greater now. But it's also important to remember um, the kind of relative scale of this, right? We have these big, big policy conversations, but the open meeting and then the journey uh, narrative. Um, there was just a report out a couple weeks ago that with the bubble banning, uh, it's actually 11 people are responsible for yeah. the show. Could you start out of all the book bans, right? So, but the, the response to it is how to scale to the people. And it's, I think it's just like one lady in North Carolina, yeah. right? So there's a lot of research. Right? Then it's, it's got but, a lot of, you know, the facts. I mean, so I think, you know, leaning on what Adam is saying, I think that this is not a time to be silent. This is a time to show that there are greater, there is just a, a bigger scale of voices on the side of teaching the truth, uh, exposing young people to different ways of knowing, learning, um, and that there are more people on the side of teaching accurate history and than there are against it. And it's because of the noise and the amplification of social media and the, you know, the significant money behind these efforts, it can seem like it's the other way around and it actually isn't. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's important. Yeah, great. Uh, a couple of comments. So one, back to the desperation of these measures, right? Anybody remember the uh, attempts to censor uh, records, especially with hip hop in the 80s, right? Uh, we're not going to get some rap, no, it's not going to be But, you know, you know the thing you saw for those who were around in that time. What happened? It made people want to buy that music even more to such an extent that artists were putting punch advisory stickers on their albums and CTVs, right? And so with a lot of these uh, books that people tried to ban, more people have been ordering books at CRT than ever would have been ordering them right before these attacks, right? So that, that's one uh, reason for some critical optimism. So back to what we can do informally, we can we can read some of those books to kids in a library or in a McDonald's or in a LBSA down the street or wherever we want to gather, right? My, my mother, rest her soul, neither of my parents had a high school education. 
And so I, you know, I come up out of the muck in some ways, but they both were readers, they both were creators. My mom of blessings on her memory has something she called table school. She taught dozens of kids how to read as broke as we were, because that was something she cared about doing. There are these informal ways we could do it. Last point about CRT, because I want to make sure I say this. Um, back to people not reading it, and back to everybody being worried about what they think is the content. The beauty and the power of CRT is in what it did as method. In other words, teachers can leverage what's happening with CRT without ever saying those letters, without ever assigning Richard Delgado, which they were never doing in high school literary. But the fact that these scholars inserted story of the people who were directly affected by these legal decisions and this emphasis on precedence that was such an art of jurisprudence, it was an intervention into how legal scholarship got done by censoring those who were impacted. Story as method, story as crucial to creating knowledge, how story can be made to play with even the most constraining conventions of a kind of scholarly discourse. We can do that in the classroom, but we ain't gotta say the words Kimberly Threshaw. And we still can go read them some Kimberly Threshaw, you know, offline if we want to. Right. So th there are some ways that we have that we can get in and intervene in all of this as dark as it feels right now. I love the help. Thank, thank you both for your awesome insights. I often think about that in the context of a science educator and in the context of science education. And you can't talk about climate justice without talking about racial justice. And so I do talk about race a lot. I raise the points and why that matters. And I'm like, they're never going to see each other. I'm the same. You know, I'm a particular science education world, but you're right. I think we have to think about the freedom to speak the truth and we talk about the truth and give power to us. Thank you. So uh, we are, we're going to go to Q&A, but we're going to amend the schedule so we, we can be on time. You're not done. So first of all, welcome. You're not part of the world program. I don't know if you know that or not. So you're, you're, you're one of ours, but you have a charge. And here's the charge. What can you do? Uh, you have approximately 10 minutes to work at your, at your table room. Why don't you generate some ideas? What might we do to invert the power of media to accomplish something that we want to accomplish in education? For me, just give me a television show. I want to be a sportscaster for science teachers. I want to circle, give me a telestrator. Look at this beautiful movie. The kid asks the question, the teacher says, that's a question. What do you think? Like, I want to show the beauty of science teaching. That's just amazing, right? So here's the question. Is there a pocket? Come on, the microphone. Is it a podcast, right? Is it a live Twitter feed? I don't know. Your decision. So in about 10 minutes, uh, or about 10 minutes, I want you to generate ideas, as many ideas as possible. How might we use media to accomplish the work of education? Before we do that, round of applause for our panel.